All right. Well, it looks like it's right at the noon hour. So thanks, everyone, for coming to um, the third third the third webinar already? Yeah, no, fourth. Fourth webinar in our hemp uh, webinar series that we're hosting this summer. And I'd like to just quickly start off by thanking our sponsors. Um, this webinar today um, is sponsored through the Northeast IPM Center, Northeast Fair, and also the Northeast Extension Risk Management and Education Grants Program. And we appreciate that funding so that we can both conduct our research and also provide outreach and education to the growers out there. And hopefully everybody receives some needed rain. At least we needed rain up here in Auburn. <laughs> we were very, very dry. And finally, over the last couple of days, we've been getting some showers. So um, it feels like a huge relief. Uh, and it seems like the hemp crop is coming along well so far, and um, but we're getting close to flowering, and that's when we definitely start to see more disease issues. So the focus of our webinar today is um, identification and management of disease in hemp, and we're joined today by Aunt, Dr. Ann Hazelrig from the University of Vermont Extension and Chris Modica from the Vermont Technical College. Both are working in hemp. Chris has been working in hemp for a number of years, and Ann with myself, we're just starting to delve in. So I just want to welcome both of our speakers. They're going to be presenting together on this topic, and they're both um, – pathologist and an expert in the field, so I'm sure we'll learn a lot. So we'll um, let them get started with the webinar in one second. I just want to introduce Susie Hodgson, who's also on the line, and Katherine Davidson um, as well, that are both helping to organize the webinar series and a part of the Northeast Extension Risk Management and Education Grant Program as well. And just so everybody knows, we still have more webinars to come. Chris Callahan from the University of Vermont will be talking, um, gosh, I guess that's, um, that's next week already, um, on CBD post-harvest um, drying and handling. So that will be um, a great topic as we get near, near harvest. So Anne and Chris, I, I'm ready to turn it over to you. Um, unless I missed something, Catherine or Susie, but I think we're ready. Okay, great. So I can just uh, share you my can screen. Share your, yeah, share your okay. screen and make sure you guys are unmuted. And um, I will say if you have any questions, just type them into the Q&A box or the chat box, and we'll get to those when we're um, when uh, Chris, and, or Chris and Ann are done speaking. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great, Chris, thanks. Take it, take it so Chris, uh, Chris and I are going to just sort of tag team it. I'm, uh, you know, I know a lot about the basics, but Chris is really good about all the practical aspects and what the growers are doing. And so um, it's a, a great combination. So I'm thrilled that we're both doing it together. Um, so I'm going to talk, we're going to talk about disease basics in hemp. All right. If my, how do I advance my thing? Oh, there, okay. So basically, uh, I'm gonna go over basics. So what is a plant disease? A plant disease is any change in the form or the function of the plant. So that's a pretty broad definition. So uh, diseases, uh, there are lots of different kinds of diseases and there are two basic kinds of diseases. One's called biotic diseases and those are, um, diseases caused by living organisms like fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes are considered um, biotic diseases. And so those are the, you know, botrytis and the leaf spot diseases, uh, some of the viruses. And then the other um, kind of disease is abiotic disease. And I see a lot of this in the plant diagnostic clinic. It's just sort of act of God type things. Um, but it's caused by non-living things. So weather, drought, nutrient deficiencies, uh, stuff like that. So we see an awful lot of abiotic stuff. So 
I know growers are quick to jump to uh, thinking something is an infectious disease, but a lot of times it's one of these abiotic or non-infectious diseases like nitrogen deficiency, another picture of zinc deficiency, uh, drought, high heat stress, if you've seen any leaf rolling in your hemp, that could be an abiotic um, problem. So the other thing that confuses me with hemp is they do all, it does all sorts of weird stuff. Um, I think they're very prone to chimeras, which are genetic mutations. So you might see one weird leaf and uh, Chris, if you could um, pipe up, I know you had said something that you had seen in one specific cultivar throughout the cultivar. Yeah, actually uh, several different cultivars, usually with um, cherry wine in the um, parentage, but um, a kind of a weird mutation where the, the every leaf is sort of crinkly and um, almost scaly. The plant is stunted over all the leaves are smaller, um, but there's kind of an army green look to it and a, and a rougher texture over the entire plant, every, every leaf on the plant. And it's one I've seen consistently over and over, different seed batches, different varieties, but usually with cherry wine in the heritage. Okay. Um, and maybe it can be as many as like, you know, 2% of the, of the plant population, or sometimes it may be even a little bit more. Um, but yeah, a real weird one. It, it'll it flower. Um, it's just everything is smaller. Yeah. But that confuses everything too, these little yeah. genetic anomalies. So just be aware of that, 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 uh, that these plants are prone to that. So when I'm going out in the field or I'm trying to diagnose uh, a hemp problem, the first thing I do is I rule out arthropods. And I know Scott uh, talked about this last week. But a lot of arthropod problems, insect problems, can look like plant diseases. And one of the main ones right now is potato leafhopper. That picture with the little circle, that's a potato leafhopper. This little guy uh, doesn't overwinter in Vermont, but blows in on storm fronts in June, and then injects a toxin into the leaves and causes that yellowing and dieback. Um, the other thing, when there's an arthropod involved, a lot of times uh, with a hand lens or looking carefully, you'll be able to see cast skins, webbing, if it's a spider mite, frass, which is insect poop, eggs, or the actual pest. So that's the first thing I do is I just eliminate that any arthropod is uh, involved. The next thing to remember when you're trying to diagnose or figure out what's wrong is remember that half that plant is underground. And so if you're seeing a symptom in the top part of the plant, like wilting or dieback, uh, it could be originating at the stem or lower in the stem or in the roots. So um, always consider that. Uh, I don't know how many growers I talk to in veg crops where they are concerned about a disease that's killing the top of the plant. And I always say, okay, what did the roots look like? And they said, oh, I haven't looked at the roots. So a shovel is a good thing to have out in the field when you're diagnosing things. Um, so roots should be healthy, white, and you shouldn't be able to strip off any part of the root. So we don't have to worry about too much about hemp root rots in the field. It's infrequent in the field unless we've got really saturated soils with rain and cool temperatures, or if you're in a, a poorly drained field or in low spots, you might have root rots. It's much more common in tomato, uh, I mean in greenhouse transplants. Um, these root rots, it's called damping off a lot of times, but it's caused by four or five different soil-borne fungi that are in all soils um, that become active when it's wet and cool and when the roots are growing slowly. So anything you can do when you're growing these transplant to keep these, the roots growing vigorously, they'll outrun these uh, soil-borne fungi. So that's what you're trying to do is grow good roots when you're growing transplants. Always start with clean flats that have been disinfested, a soilless mix that won't have any of these fungi in it. And then a lot of the, at least the vegetable growers use root shield or trichoderma in the, um, in the mix just to help with some of the root uh, problems, root diseases. So when I'm looking at for the next thing I try to do is 
is it an abiotic disease or is it a biotic disease? And there are a lot of good clues for these abiotic problems. And it just helps when you're out in the field and you look at the whole thing, you stand back, and um, there are various ways to figure out whether it's abiotic. So with abiotic stuff, often there's a pattern of injury. You might see an entire row, you might see something going on in the entire crop. And almost always when most of the crop is affected like that, it is abiotic. Um, of course, it, that can change. Like if we've got a wet, cool uh, uh, bout of weather when, and the plants are flowering, you might see a lot of botrytis blight. But um, earlier on or in, the most, in most cases, if you see a pattern like this, um, that row of evergreens at the bottom. So you see that dead part stopping at one certain level and that's where the salts kind of sprayed onto the bottom of the shrub. So living organisms don't look like that. They're much more random. It will be much more hit or miss, not consistent. Also with uh, abiotic stuff, this stuff comes on quickly, like overnight. If your stuff looked great yesterday and today something's, you know, killing the plant, uh, often it's something abiotic because living organisms uh, build up slowly. <clears throat> this middle picture is of a hemp plant that got hit by a hailstorm. So the day before, the hemp, all the hemp field looked great. This hail came through and uh, it's ruined. Another good clue is one age of tissue. If you see only one age of tissue affected, uh, that's a good clue that it's abiotic. I see a lot of that in the early season when you know, those, uh, the leaves that were coming out when the uh, uh, plants were just put in the field, they might have had some cold injury or frost injury, but then the plant grows out of it. So if I see damage only in those lower leaves, it's something that happened when those were small and either cold or frost or uh, something that, like that. Um, if you see a gradient of injury in the crop, you know, you look on, at one place in the field and it looks horrible or devastated, and then as you move farther and farther away, it looks better, that's often a clue that it's um, abiotic. And that's, I see that with salt injury on the pine trees next to the highway or this other picture of the oak uh, with herbicide <clears throat> damage. You saw curled and twisted oaks near where the sprayer had, uh, they had used the sprayer and then farther away, it looked, they looked better and better. Also, if you see more than one crop affected, when I get phone calls saying, my hemp is dying, my tomatoes are dying, my lilacs are affected. There's something else going on because these plant pathogens in general are pretty host specific. So if you see more than one genus of plant affected, it, it's probably abiotic. There's, I just, oh, yeah, I go just ahead. wanted to jump, uh, sorry, jump in here and just mention, um, especially when you're using plastic mulches that just watching the pattern of um, damage and being sure to check and see if that drip line is is leaking right there and you have um, you know a whole flood event under the plastic that you're not seeing that you're seeing the effect in the plant but just be sure that the that you're checking the irrigation either you know leaks or blockages or something because that could be a a, a real issue especially under plastic. Yeah, that's true on root rots. I've actually seen in veg crops, I've seen black plastic when we've really had high temperatures and the transplant are touching the black plastic. I've yeah. seen damage that way. Um, there's no cure for these. Uh, the plant should grow out of it. So I always tell growers, watch the new growth. If that looks good, then, then it's probably uh, abiotic. And it's kind of tough sometimes to figure out what did happen, but um, uh, it really, it's important to get that past history of the crop and try to ask questions and look at the big picture. So on the biotic, if I've ruled out abiotic uh, diseases, then I think, okay, maybe it's a biotic pathogen. It's a living organism causing this problem. And the living organisms are fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, higher plants are all considered um, biotic plant, path plant pathogens. And probably for the most part, we see mainly fungi, uh, some virus diseases. So we just got a grant, Heather and I, to look at nematodes and impacts of nematodes on um, hemp. So that'll be kind of interesting. I don't see much uh, in the way of bacterial diseases in hemp, or I haven't. 
seen it yet, but I would suspect you'd see that in maybe the mid-Atlantic states with where it's a little warmer and uh, wetter. So often with these biotic living organisms, there's a sign, which is a technical term that means the actual presence of the pathogen. And that's what you're looking for. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about how fungus diseases work, because that's pretty much the main thing you're gonna see as a biotic organism. And all fungi, all fungus diseases pretty much work the same way. So um, the fruiting body of a fungus, we're all familiar with what mushrooms look like. That's a fruiting body of a fungus. But the ones, the plant pathogens are typically microscopic or very small, but they all work the same way. So this is uh, Botrytis blight in hemp. It's the scourge. It's the worst uh, disease, I think, for everybody. And if you look at that uh, picture on the right, um, those are all the little fruiting bodies of that fungus. So all, um, you can see those with the naked eye. Uh, it always helps if you have a hand lens, but um, those are the fruiting bodies. So if I looked at that fruiting body of botrytis or gray mold under the microscope, that's a close-up picture of it. It's got these spores on the fruiting body and those spores are really lightweight. They're carried on wind currents, on tools. They move around really easily. So seeing those spores in the fruiting bodies, that's actually a sign or the presence of the pathogen. You can know for sure that you've got a biotic disease. So in botrytis or in any fungus, these spores are liberated, they land on a leaf. Um, if they get the right conditions, these spores germinate. They're like the seeds of a fungus. And the right conditions are, for most fungi, six to eight hours of leaf wetness or high humidity. So um, if they get that six to eight hours of leaf wetness, that spore germinates, starts growing through those um, leaf cells. Fungi are amazing. They can dissolve plant cells, grow throughout the system all on their own. They don't need a wound or a, a natural opening. So they grow into the plant cells and then they feed on those cells. So when you look at a leaf spot, you're seeing the dead area where that fungus is already fed. Most fungi overwinter on diseased refuse or some may have long-term overwintering structures like a disease we're gonna talk about called white mold. Um, so that's why we want to rotate, we want to get out of those fields, we want to clean up fields at the end of the season because all those fungal diseases uh, will overwinter there and they'll become more of a problem next year. So the other signs of uh, the presence of the pathogen for fungi, these long-term overwintering structures are called sclerotia, that's the middle picture. Those are hardened masses of mycelium, which are the threads of the fungus. Uh, so those are the things you're looking for when you're trying to figure out if it's a fungus disease. Hyphae or mycelium sclerotia or fruiting bodies and spores. So all, all fungus disease work that way and it's helpful. That's why in rainy seasons, we're gonna see a lot more fungus disease because you've got all the right infection periods. And so in a summer like this year, it's been pretty dry. So we're not seeing a whole lot of plant uh, fungal diseases and it's all because of those um, not having that leaf wetness. That's the other reason you don't wanna overhead irrigate is because you don't wanna wet those leaves anytime you don't have to. So one of the most important things with plant diseases is scout. You gotta go out in your fields on a regular basis, going into the inner fields, the low areas, the edges, because once you find a disease, it's easier to manage pests or diseases if you find them early. So in the case of uh, Botrytis gray mold, this is the most economically damaging hemp disease and it's everywhere. This one does have a wide host range. It can attack tomatoes, uh, hemp, lilacs, anything. Uh, so this one is kind of an exception and it can attack any plant part, whether it's alive or dead. So um, it can uh, be on dead tissue. It, it loves to get established on dead tissue, especially in high tunnels. It likes cooler temperatures and high moisture, probably uh, you know more like fall conditions, and which is just the worst thing for growers because that's when you're trying to get flowers and seeds. Um, and then as the flower buds mature, that's when you really want to scout for botrytis. And those gray spores are visible to the naked eye. And Chris has some good advice about 
how to scout botrytis flowers? Yeah, so first, um, scouting on a nice dry day, so you're not vectoring things yourself, um, but uh, with a lot of uh, territory to cover, you just kind of want to strategize how you're going to move through the field and do a really good survey. But um, I start kind of by looking at the, the funkiest looking uh, flowers that have any necrotic um, visible necrosis on the outside of the, the flower, um, any of the little leaves that look necrotic. Um, oftentimes I'm seeing uh, botrytis in those buds that have visible um, necrotic tissue on the exterior. Though um, there's many dense flowers that look beautiful that you um, kind of crack over, open the bud and they can be rotted inside without any seeing any sign of it whatsoever on the, on the exterior. But doing a really good survey of your um, flower as things start to become more dense um, and then just really paying attention to your own um, habits. If you do run into some disease, making sure that you're either wearing gloves and changing your gloves or washing your hands so that you're not then just touching bud after bud after bud with um, botrytis spores. <laughs> so, um, but, but doing this as a, on a really regular basis, checking different plants every time, um, making sure you're really doing a good survey of your whole field. Great. So once these plants become dense too, that, you know, if there's a rain, they don't dry off quicker. So you get more infection periods, the denser yeah. these plants uh, become. So as far as botrytis management, anytime we're trying to manage these biotic pathogens, living organisms, plant pathologists like to talk about this thing called the disease triangle. And it's really a great way to try to think about managing diseases because it fits for any of these biotic diseases. And it just means that for any biotic disease to occur, you've got to have the right environment, you've got to have the pathogen present, and you've got to have a susceptible host. So when we're trying to manage disease, we're trying to eliminate one leg of that triangle or manage one leg of that triangle uh, to minimize the amount of disease. So in the case of botrytis management, if we wanted to try to manage the environment, uh, you know, in the field, we'd lower uh, relative humidity by avoiding overcrowding, using plant, good plant spacing, orienting rows so that you take advantage of the wind. In the greenhouse, it's a matter of spacing space plants out, lower, keep lower humidity with roll-up sides, venting, fans. Sometimes uh, growers, uh, at least in the case of tomatoes, I know they have to, if the humidity is so high that they have to vent and heat at the same time to drive out that moisture. But the goal is to keep the moisture below 85%, uh, and, and then you shouldn't get botrytis in a high tunnel or greenhouse. Um, as far as manipulating the host, there are no resistant cultivars for this disease. Everything is susceptible. Um, managing the pathogen, botrytis can overwinter as a sclerotia. That was that long-term overwintering structure. It's a mass of the mycelia. So you want to clean up all that disease debris uh, in the field. If you can, get it out of the field, tilling it under, getting it to break down as fast as possible is the best thing to do because you don't want that stuff to overwinter um, and it will overwinter on tissue. In the greenhouse also you need to clean up debris and any senescing tissue, any dying tissue. Uh, the other thing you can do for the pathogen, rotation. You know, try to, for veg growers, we try to recommend three-year rotations. I'm not sure that that's going to be possible with hemp, um, but yeah, it'd be great if you could rotate among fields just so these plant diseases don't build up. Uh, and there are protectant fungicides um, that you can use. Chris is going to, she's got more experience with this. Uh, but if you've got the right environmental conditions, i.e. really high humidity, the fungicides we have to work with probably can't overcome this disease anyway. So, um, but Chris does has, have some good uh, practical advice when it comes to using some of these things that are on the state list. Yeah, so um, the peroxide materials and, and specifically I've used zero tall, but Sanidate is also another one 
Um, they can be used pre or post harvest. So um, they're good tools if you do see botrytis on your, when you're scouting, you can spray while the plant, while you're still waiting for um, a harvest opportunity. Um, you can cut things out and then spray to mitigate any um, infection of that wound. Um, and then some growers are trying dipping. And this has been a technique that's been used with THC cannabis where flower buds post harvest, um, so that is after they've been harvested, are then dipped in a peroxide solution um, to mitigate any issues. This is, you know, research needs to be done. It's um, definitely something that seems to hold some promise. But the concern here is making sure that those um, colas, those flower stems are then dried very, very quickly before they're put in, in, into their drying situation, whether you're hanging to dry um, or what, they need to be dried off. And in this picture, um, these have been dipped and now they're hanging to dry before going into a, a dry room. So that's something that you could maybe play around with just noting that any um, solution that you're using for a dip should really be at maybe half strength and you're going to want to experiment before just wholesale taking on this technique on a crop. Um, this has been used for product that's, that's going to a smokable uh, flower rather than extraction, um, but it is one of the few things that the state is um, confident is safe to apply to flour because it's non-residual. So, so just there's really not that many materials you can apply to flour, certainly none of the oils. Um, so, so it leaves us with very few tools. So this, this I think is a really solid one to have in the tool chest. Great. Yeah, and we always try to encourage growers, you know, if they want to try it out, uh, dip some and then leave a control just so you can see if there really is a difference. Yes. Yeah. Really helpful. Um, so leaf spot diseases, leaf spots are just circular dead spots on, a, on the leaf. Usually they start lower in the plant because that's where the air circulation is poorest. Um, and often they have an advancing yellow margin. So where that leaf spot is, that's where the fungus has grown through that tissue and fed on all those cells. And there are lots of leaf spot diseases in, um, in hemp, the lots of different fungi. You can't always tell which one is which out in the field and it probably doesn't matter, it's academic. Uh, you're gonna manage them pretty much the same way. Um, and basically it's again, trying to manage the environment by letting, spacing the plants so they dry off quickly, avoiding overhead irrigation uh, the host, there's probably no resistant cultivars, but um, Chris probably kn definitely knows more about this, but you may notice differences in sus susceptibility of cultivars. So I always encourage growers to keep track, keep a, you know, a journal and, and write down if you see less disease in one cultivar than another. Uh, managing the pathogen, uh, these leaf spot diseases definitely overwinter in plant debris. So cleaning up the field, rotating every three years, um, using mulches, since it overwinters in the field, if you use a mulch, that, uh, that provides a barrier, so you won't have as much splash up onto those lower leaves. And so once they splash up onto those lower leaves, every time we get a rainfall or six to eight hours of leaf wetness, those leaf spots produce more spores and they move farther up in the plant. So by the end of the season, you could have a total defoliation in a really wet year. Um, could I just jump in here? I just wanted to yeah. respond to one of the questions. Um, the, uh, there are several peroxide um, products that are on the state list. Um, definitely this, I would, you know, you want to check your state list, but um, these have been vetted by the, the Agency of Agriculture and um, they're, they're available um, and, you know, definitely um, whatever, legal, as far as the this, this state is concerned. So I just wanted to address that concern that, that one of the participants had. Great. And this was your slide talking about pruning? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so um, pruning uh, a whole field, you know, acres and acres of 
um, hemp, huge hemp plants for biomass is probably not worth the labor, but uh, depending on what your market is for, um, for primo flour or smokable flour, it might be worth um, doing some pruning as you're weeding. Um, and this can really help to mitigate some of the issues with some of those leaf spots, those soil-borne diseases. Um, so just skinning up the plant, taking off um, any of the lower branches, especially any bud sites and branches that don't get good um, you know, exposure to the sun that aren't gonna mature very well anyway, can be more of a liability than an asset. And if you have the time and the labor um, to just remove some of those and any of the, the lower fan leaves, that can really help with um, just slowing down any spread of those, um, those leaf spots and really create much more of an airy plant, especially that interior to prevent some of those um, mildews and, and maybe even help mitigate some botrytis later on in the maturity of the plant. Okay, powdery mildew, that's another one that uh, probably might start showing up now. This is a, diff a little bit different pathogen. It doesn't need that six to eight hours of leaf wetness. Actually, it's inhibited by free water. It only, uh, to germinate and to spread quickly, it only needs high humidity, something over 85%. And the symptoms are just the white powdery coating on the upper surface of the foliage, uh, in the field, often after warm, humid weather, we've had really good powdery mildew weather lately, it seems like. Um, this disease uh, will only live on live tissue, so um, it won't overwinter uh, the way, it could be a problem in the greenhouse, but uh, it won't overwinter the way uh, the leaf spot diseases do. Managing it, again, the same old thing, looking at that uh, disease triangle, spacing uh, plants, humidity, um, trying to, anything you can do to reduce humidity. Um, I can't see what, I, what else I wrote. My face is in front of my writing. Um, uh, for the host, managing the host, uh, there are resistant cultivars to this disease. So definitely take advantage of, of that if, um, if you've got a good cultivar that's resistant. Uh, pathogen, uh, I don't know what that says because my our faces are in the way, but um, basically there are some good uh, fungicides, uh, materials that you can use, horticultural oils, neem, um, those are allowable, right? And Chris, you might have, I forget if you had a, uh, did you have anything more to say about materials? Yeah, on, yeah? I, I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember if neem is on the list. Um, I, I think it's a really good uh, control measure um, in, in vegetative growth, not of course in flower, um, but you just need to check that state list. But the, the peroxides will also work for this. Um, there's a lot of good oils on the list that will work for powdery mildew um, that are, um, again, only in, in vegetative growth, not in flower. Um, but one of the great things you'll notice about um, hemp outside in the field versus inside in the greenhouse is a nice rain, a good solid rain will wash a lot of your the sporulating parts of the powdery mildew away. <laughs> so water is a great like knockback um, with a little velocity as long as the, then you have that plant has time to dry out. Um, and again, that's more of a concern later in flower when you have dense tissue and those, those big rain events are maybe beating back your powdery mildew, but encouraging botrytis. <laughs> it's, it's, if it's not one thing, it's another. Is that it's, on the yeah. state list, that rain? Is that allowable? In yeah, actually hydrogen dioxide <laughs> is on the state list. <laughs> Okay, so what if you go out in the field and you see wilting? Um, if you see wilting in the entire field, you know, when you think back about these abiotic things, that's probably abiotic. So if it's affecting the whole crop, uh, you know, that's when you look at your irrigation system, you think about how hot it's been or dry, things like that. However, if you see individual plants wilting, uh, like hit or miss, 
always look lower in the plant to try to figure out what's causing, for some reason, something's interrupting the flow of water and nutrients up to the top of the plant. So look lower in the plant. The biggest problem in hemp is a disease called white mold, sclerotinia white mold. And it's kind of a cool one because it's easy to diagnose. Uh, you see this really fluffy white rot on the stem. It causes a canker. Um, so that's easy to see, uh, usually where it's, uh, the tissue is dense. Um, and then if you open up that or peel back that white mycelium, you'll see these little black hardened sclerotia, these overwintering structures. And those are something you don't want to drop in your field. So if you've got this disease, if you see it, uh, like for tomato growers in high tunnels, I cut it off at the base, get it, bag it, get it out of the house. Because you don't want those sclerotia to drop in your fields because they can live for seven to 10 years and just wait for the right conditions to germinate again. So the sclerotinia has a really pretty wide host range, beans, potatoes. Um, it's hit or miss, like I said. Usually you'll see it in wet areas or poorly drained areas. Um, so when you're choosing a site, you want to avoid those poorly drained areas. Rotation will help. Um, again, spacing for good air circulation. And like I said, cut off the plant at the base and get it out of the field because you don't want those sclerotia um, in the field. So the other uh, plant disease that we see uh, a fair amount or we think it, we might be seeing it are virus diseases. And viruses are submicroscopic particles of protein and nucleic acid. I cannot diagnose those in my lab if I uh, think I've got a virus involved. I have to send it off to a lab where they can do the, the testing for that. But symptoms of viruses are modeling, stunting, leaf roll, chlorosis, curling, twisting, and spotting throughout the plant. Um, so there are lots of different virus diseases. I would never be able to even hazard a guess as to which one you might have in your plant. They can be seaborne or introduced by wounds, vectors, or tools. Um, they don't spread in the field without a vector or something, you know, getting it into the plant. And there's no cure for viruses. So if you see one funky plant that's got curled and twisted leaves out in the middle of the field, just cut it off, get it out of there, because you don't want something moving it around to uh, your other plants. And testing for viruses, we're happy to send things off, but uh, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot as to what virus you're looking for. And it's really expensive to do a tomato screen for tomato viruses. I think it's $250 for the first plant. And then the next plant is $50. So uh, we don't test much for virus, virus diseases. So just to, to wrap up, uh, this was a broad overview. I think hopefully Heather um, posts this uh, somewhere uh, so people can access it later. But disease management in general, always start with healthy transplants, clean flats. You want the best, most vigorous plants to go out in the field. Choosing a good site with good drainage and soil fertility. Uh, plant with good spacing to promote air circulation. That will, that's probably one of the best things you can do uh, in the field. I know we like to crowd things together, but spread them out if you've got the land. Scout, get out there and look for stuff. Rotate hemp growing fields. Use drip irrigation and mulches to prevent splash up. Uh, use sanitation. So that just means if you see a virus or you see that white mold, go in and get rid of that plant. Get it out of the field so it can't spread. Uh, and then clean up fields after harvest. And Chris has some good advice about some of the biologicals, if you want to use that. Yeah, and, and um, there's a lot of products out there, and there's kind of a culture in THC cannabis of using all sorts of inputs, um, many of them um, not proven, and many of them based on some kind of biological, so, so a live organism in the, the um, product. So I just wanted to touch on this regalia. It seems to show a lot of pro uh, progress, a uh, promise rather, this is not a, I, uh, does not have a live organism. It's a botanical extract of a, a type of knotweed, um, but it, it seems to stimulate the plant, natural plant defenses, basically turn on plant defenses um, 
And so it's kind of exciting product to, to look into. Um, this regalia, as with many of the other biologicals, they have to be reapplied again and again. And there were some growers um, last year that really had a great routine with some of the bacillus uh, products where they were actually going out there and spraying acres and acres with biologicals as a defense against um, mainly botrytis uh, with some success. So spray equipment is really important in any kind of um, routine. Uh, um, you know, just really good spraying equipment and uh, practices. But just a note that any of these biologicals need to be stored properly. So you can get a barrel of something. Um, there's barrels you can buy of um, trichoderma that, to put through your drip irrigation. But if those, if those containers are then just left out in the field to heat up to, you know, 100 plus degrees, you're going to really knock back any of the efficacy of those living organisms in that um, in that solution. So just same with freezing too. Is that yeah. The same? yeah. Yeah. So um, it's tricky. So, so, uh, trichoderma can be frozen. It, hmm. Trichodermas um, can actually be that can increase the the um, the life, the shelf life of, of the product, but heating definitely not. Yeah. Um, and these I'm, do just have a, a shelf life. You don't want to use more than yeah. two-year-old materials anyway, right? On these. Yeah, and the shelf life is, it's going to completely depend on your storage. Right. So it can be a printed shelf life, but if you let it sit out there and it's, it's been sitting in 90 degrees and so the, the content's heating up past 100, it's, that's not going to be the shelf life of the actual materials in, you know, so you're kind of possibly wasting your money. So right. be sure you test any material that still looks like it have a, has a shelf life um, and make sure it's still uh, efficacious, it's still alive, um, and be uh, aware that a lot of products uh, claim to have a lot of, you know, whatever miraculous um, mm -hmm. uh, abilities that that aren't really proven. So stay with, I would say, horticultural or agriculturally proven product lines um, and be skeptical of some of the, um, the cannabis specific uh, product lines of biologicals. Just buyer beware and note that these, this is a lovely sort of direction to go in with, with um, control products, but it's live organisms that have to be there, the life and the needs of those organisms in our control measures have to be considered as well. Great. Uh, just to wrap up, um, I run the plant diagnostic clinic at UVM, and uh, I'm uh, I'm closed to home gardeners due to COVID-19, but I'm still open for business uh, with commercial growers. So I'm happy to look at samples, try to help you diagnose something. Uh, take down my um, email address there because I'm asking people to email me first, and a lot of times you can start with a picture. Um, but email me and then I'm having growers uh, drop things off at my house or mail things to my house and then I know when they come in because the mail's a little sketchy these days. Um, so I'm happy to help any uh, commercial grower. So with that, that's Disease Basics 101 um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was that was excellent and um, lots of great information. So it looks like we do have um, a few questions. If folks have questions, please pop them into the chat box or the Q and A box. And I believe Catherine, you're going to launch a, um, a a couple of questions survey. So we would really appreciate it if you could take a minute and answer the two survey questions that we have that help us um, document if you've gained any new knowledge from the webinars that we're hosting. So please take a second and um, answer those. And um, the, all the webinars are being recorded if um, we get permission from the speakers and those are posted about a week after the webinar is 
about a week after our webinar is hosted live, so it will be on our website. Um, so it will be available. And let's start with a few questions. So Marones, Regalia, and Stargus were EPA listed for industrial hemp for 2020. Are they also on the Vermont list, and what might their efficacy be? efficacy be against Botrytis and Septoria? I think you mentioned Regalia um, as mm -hmm. well. So, um, Chris, maybe? Well, Regalia is definitely on the, on the Vermont state list. What was the other material that you mentioned? Stargus? Stargus? S-P-A-R-G-U-S. -S. Also mm -hmm. from, I, I think, Marone Innovations. I'm not familiar with that. I don't know what the active ingredient is. Um, the state list sometimes goes, just mentions the active ingredient and gives some example um, products, but but isn't you know it's much more based on that active ingredient as the is the whatever <laughs> focus of the the yes or no. Yeah, um, and I don't know if Stephanie um, Stephanie Smith is on either or somebody from the agency. They may have have the list handy. Yeah, I was trying to, to pull it up. Um, okay. um, Do these state lists vary widely from state to state? Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Um, for instance, Massachusetts doesn't allow anything unless they've changed, doesn't allow any EPA <laughs> registered materials because there there's, isn't cannabis on the label. So that's how they avoided that conundrum, whereas Vermont kind of gives a waiver um, on materials that maybe don't have cannabis on the label, but they view as, as useful. So um, trichoderma, that was one of the questions, um, is on the Vermont list, Root Shield is on the Vermont list. Um, I'm not seeing the, um, Argus, oh, Argus, um, but it's, I, I would encourage people who have questions to go on to the, um, Agency of Agriculture's hemp site, and it's, it's a great, very useful, uh, and I think a very, um, you know, a reasonable <laughs> list that we have for hemp. Just just noting that not all of the things on the list are appropriate for flour. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm promoting the peroxides is they basically volatilize and that's what the state is feeling um, very confident with them on later into flour is their, you know, they are non-residual as far as the state is concerned chemically. Um, so was there another uh, question about the state list that I? There is, and we'll, um, we'll post it in the chat box here um, so people have it. There is a question about natural bioproducts. Um, this has come up a couple of times recently in talks I've been a part of. Will the natural bioproducts interfere with testing for, for aerobic bacteria or total yeast mold, which will be required by the Agency of Ag this fall. So this has definitely been a discussion um, around. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if you know anything about that, Chris. Um, I know it's been a real concern with the use of any biologicals. Um, someone from the agency should really weigh in, but I know for other states, they're taking total counts and those biologicals might definitely show up as part of the total count. There is real concern, but uh, yeah, I'm not the person to know if, they, if there's a way to suss out um, good life versus bad life as far as those, you know, the testing. Yeah, it was interesting. I was on a national hemp research conference, I think it was last week, and the same question came up and nobody seemed to have um, an answer. And also, um, some of the researchers hadn't 
seen this and if, and they were wondering if anybody ha if this had actually been a problem like if the agency of agriculture is seeing this um, that you know people would like to see those tests and samples so we can figure out if you know if this is actually the issue so yeah. okay another question is um, uh, it sounds like um, to somebody saying red clover and the rosacea family are good early indicators for powdery mildew as IPM. So basically using those to time um, preventative application. Um, is that something you've you know heard of people doing? So basically using other crops as indicators of when to start spraying hemp. Um, especially roses or red clover. Yeah, I know in other crops, like the vineyards always planted something, roses, I think, to indicate when they should start spraying for powdery mildew. Um, it's probably not a bad idea, but a better idea is just go out in your field and, and, and look for it. But um, I think as soon as you, we have warm, uh, humid weather, you should assume that it's going to be time for powdery mildew. Um, but yeah, it couldn't hurt to have an indicator plant. It won't be the same uh, genus and species. Yeah, right. That's that's what I was going to say. It may yeah. not. It may indicate the the conditions more than right. The, right. Because all the, the powdery mildews are very host specific. So, so a cucumber powdery mildew will not uh, affect hemp or or the rose powdery mildew won't. So. I would throw in here that if you do have any uh, clonal production, like generally the seed production, if you're doing a good job in the greenhouse, um, you know, you can probably produce a pretty clean seed transplant for the field that doesn't have powdery mildew. Again, if, if your greenhouse management is pretty good. But if you, if you have other clones hanging around or stock plants, that's where you really might um, see powdery mildew going from your transplants um, from the greenhouse to the field. Um, and with powdery mildew, less is less. The less you have in the beginning, the less you'll have at the end. Um, so just being, a, just maybe separating seed production and clonal production um, if you have both of those streams going on at your, on your property. Okay. Well, I think most of the questions have been answered. Um, Catherine did put in the chat um, the web link to the state, uh, Vermont state site, and I, there's a couple comments, and this has already been mentioned. Please make sure you check with your state before you assume you can apply anything to the hemp. Um, every state is very different in their approach. Um, I know Maine, uh, Massachusetts as well is really limited and what you can apply to the hemp. Um, let's see, I'm gonna check for any last questions. We're definitely coming up at the end of the hour. So I looked up, uh, I looked up asparagus and I couldn't find, it keeps taking me to asparagus. So <laughs> I, I don't know what this <laughs> <is. laughs> Yeah, it looks like Abba posted that it's a bacillus um, product that's mm -hmm. in Stargus. So, okay. Um, Yep. Great. Well, great. I want to thank, thank our speakers, Ann and Chris. Thank you so much for all the great information. And like I said, the webinar will be um, posted in probably about a week so people can re-listen or get on and listen if they miss it today. And um, thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.